our seminar series. So uh, Stephanie will start us off in a few minutes. Just an update on the May symposium at Brown. We, we now have uh, Jesse Barber from Boise State as our second confirmed keynote speaker. So um, I hope you will all consider coming to Brown and joining our symposium. So now I'll turn it over to Stephanie okay, from the Naval Undersea Warfare Center Division in Newport. Thank you. Jan, did you have something you wanted to? Yep, I'm recording. I'm going to mute everybody right now, and then I'm going to unmute you, Steph, just so we have no background noise. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, hold on a second. Mute all. And Stephanie, you are now unmuted, and I'm going to mute myself, and then you can take it over. Okay, great. Thanks, Jen. And let me know if you, there's any problems with the audio, if you can't hear me at all. Um, so as she said, my name is uh, Stephanie Wallen. I'm at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Newport, Rhode Island, and I am a biologist that works on a bunch of different programs, but one of them is with the Marine Mail Monitoring on Navy Ranges Program, or M3R, and I'm just going to give you a bunch of highlights today about the program. As soon as I can figure out how to advance. Okay. So I want to start out by um, <clears throat> first acknowledging all of our sponsors, which are primarily from the Department of the Navy, the Department of Defense, and other U.S. government agencies. And we also have a variety of collaborators which make the work possible from other U.S. and international government agencies, academia, nonprofits, and small businesses. So it's really important to recognize that a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is really collaborative in nature. And I also want to acknowledge um, all of our current and former members of the M3R team, and especially, especially want to acknowledge Dave Moretti, who just recently retired, but uh, who developed and lobbied for and managed and made happen uh, the M3R program in general. So everyone on the team currently has uh, a lot of different specialties that they work on and that they're responsible for. And it's sort of um, everybody working together that really makes this possible and keeps the program running. Okay, so what are the drivers for the M3R program? Well, one of the general motivations for looking at the impacts of Navy activities on marine mammals was a mass stranding that occurred in the Bahamas in March of 2000. Um, there was at the time a U.S. Navy uh, exercise where there were three submarines and seven surface ships, um, six of which were operating mid-frequency sonars in the Northwest Providence Channel. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that's this region here. This is all the Bahamas. Um, you can see that the, the symmetry is kind of crazy there, and this is that, that channel. And during, immediately, during and immediately after um, the event, there were 17 animals that stranded, seven that died, and what was unusual about the stranding was that 14 of the animals that stranded were beaked whales. So beaked whales are deep diving, infrequently seen species. They don't generally occur in large groups, and they don't generally show up on the beach during strandings. So the fact that 14 of them stranded was highly unusual. So from this event, um, it suggested that beaked whales might be more sensitive to sonar than other species. And you can see in these dots here, these are the locations of the strandings from the beaked whales, which were in red and yellow here. And then there was also some minke whales and a spotted dolphin that also stranded. So just to give you a little background on beaked whales, for those of you that are more terrestrially oriented, uh, there are so far thought to be 22 species of beaked whales in the family Zirphidae. They generally feed and occur in small groups of so just a few animals. They forage for squid and fish during long, deep dives. And what I'm showing you here is a slide that I stole from National Geographic that's showing uh, five of the deepest diving animals recorded to date, generally by carrying animal born um, recorders. And you can see that three of the species listed here, Blainville's beaked whale, Baird's beaked whale, and Cuvier's beaked whale are beaked whales. So they are very deep diving as a family of uh, species. And Cuvier's currently holds the record at diving to almost three kilometers below the surface. That's like more than eight Empire State buildings for scale. And they do this all on one breath, basically. Take a breath, dive down, spend up to an hour, 
down below the water and then return up to the surface. So while these animals are diving in a foraging dive, they produce echolocation clicks, um, generally below 200 meters. And the groups, when they are foraging, they're typically echolocating for about 30 to 40 minutes altogether. And it turns out that the Bahamas event is not an isolated event. There have been a number of stranding events uh, where more than two animals stranded at the same time that have potentially been associated with military sonar in the past several decades. And I want to point out that most of these events are not in the U.S. Navy. There are other international navies as well. And so all of these dot, all these locations with a red dot um, had a beaked whale that occurred within the stranding at some, at least one of the stranding events at that location. So again, these are species that are difficult to study at sea. Not a lot is known about them uh, at the time. And they were not frequently seen in the general population of stranded animals. So therefore, they seem, as I said before, to be more sensitive to sonar exposure. So aside from generally being concerned, as the Navy is, is considered a steward of the sea, um, why is the sensitivity of beaked whales to sonar a problem for the U.S. Navy? Well, the Navy maintains a bunch of training ranges, which is where sailors must pass mandatory training exercises before deploying to operational duty and where the R&D community within the Navy tests equipment before and after it's, stall it's installed on operational platforms. So what I'm showing you here are three of the major training and testing ranges that the U.S. Navy operates. And uh, what's interesting is that all three of them appear to have populations of beaked whales that are found for either all or part of the year. So in the uh, off Hawaii here is the Pacific Missile Range Facility, where there's populations of Blainville's and Cuvier's beaked whales, the Southern California Offshore Range, which has Cuvier's beaked whales, and the Atlantic Undersea Test and Evaluation Center, or AUTEC, which has Blainville's, Cuvier's, and Gervais beaked whales. So we have these deep water ranges with populations of the species thought to be more sensitive to sonar in areas where the Navy is conducting more frequent sonar testing. So that doesn't seem like a great thing. Um, and these three ranges that I'm showing you also happen to be instrumented ranges. So they have a network of hydrophones or underwater microphones on the seafloor, which the Navy uses for tracking targets and other platforms during these training events. Now, just before the Bahamas stranding, uh, Dave Moretti and Josh Schaefer at Newark put in a proposal to ONR, which started the M3R program. And so in 2000, they were funded to start at AUTEC, this, um, the training range that's in the Bahamas, and to look at using the network of hydrophones that are available for tracking of operational platforms to track marine mammal vocalizations, and then develop tools to do this and to use it to effectively look at the impact of uh, sonar on the behavior of the species. So that was the beginning of the MPR program. And from that initial work, the overall goals of the program have started to develop to what they are today. So primarily, primarily is to provide state-of-the-art systems and algorithms for passive acoustic detection, classification, localization, and density estimation. <clears throat> and then to use those tools to conduct research on marine mammals, both the primary like initial research on general behavior of foraging, distribution, habitat use, et cetera, but also to more applied um, questions such as the effects from Navy activities. With the overall goal of the entire program to understand the long-term health of these populations that are living on these Navy ranges, and then also what we can learn from that to apply to um, animals living in other areas. So this is just a schematic of the um, hydrophones at AUTEC that I'm going to talk about first. And I want to super briefly go over some of the basic data processing tools that we use with the hydrophone array data, and then go over some of the studies that we're using these data to, and what questions we're trying to answer. OK, so the species of highest interest, as you can see from, from the background I just gave you, um, are beaked whales. And there are differences in frequency content and production and echolocation click characteristics across species, which we can use to our advantage in passive acoustic monitoring. So what you can see here on the right is that there are differences in uh, the energy at different frequencies in these three different species of beaked whales, so Gervais, Cuvier's, and Blainville's. 
And you can see how the distribution of energy across the different frequencies is somewhat different across the three. And on the left, you can see the values for the foraging click inner click interval. So this, this is the time between where an animal makes one click, listens for echoes to come back, and then makes a second click. And in beak whales, this inner click interval is pretty highly species specific. So in, on average, uh, you can see that in red circles here are the inner click intervals um, for three to these three different species. And you can see that they're um, a, a fair bit different, and we can use those differences to try to estimate which animals we think are present on the range at any given time. So you can see that the inner click interval is highest uh, in the Cuvier's beaked whale and generally lowest in Gervais' beaked whale. Okay, so briefly, there are two sets of detectors and classifiers that we pass the hydrophone data through. And what we're generally saving in the program is only the outputs of these detectors. Because if we have, if you saw how many hydrophones there were at ATTAC and we have multiple ranges, the volume of data to save raw recordings from all the hydrophones all the time is just an impossible data set to manage. So we're only trying to um, record things that we detect that are of interest to us. So the first type of detector we have is an FFT-based detector, which is basically just looking for energy above some threshold within an FFT bin. And so it says one or zero as to whether there's energy there or not. And this results in a binary FFT. And then we have a rough classification based on the frequency band with the most energy. So for example, if most of the energy is in the 24 to 48 kilohertz band, then we roughly classify this as a beaked rail, just for starts. And then this other set is the class-specific support vector machine detector classifiers, and these were developed by Sue Jarvis. And these use species-specific parameters to classify into specific groups. So Sue currently has developed uh, SVM classifiers for foraging clicks and buzz clicks for two species of beaked whales, for Blainville's beaked whale and Cuvier's beaked whale, and then regular clicks for sperm whales, and then general dolphin echolocation clicks. And these are some examples of these hard limited FFT displays. And these are showing you some of the sounds that we have verified coming from different species of cetaceans. So in the top left, you can see the Blainville's beak trail. These are their regular echolocation clicks. Um, and you can see that, again, like I said before, most energy is in the 24 to 48 kilohertz band. On the top right is a sperm whale. These are just regular clicks from a sperm whale that you can see look quite different, much lower in frequency. On the bottom, Left is the common dolphin. These are mostly whistles, but you can see some echolocation clicks in there as well. And then on the bottom right is a uh, fin whale. So these are the really low frequency down tubes for the fin whale. Um, and what you can tell from looking at these is that we are able to visually um, uh, classify different vocalizations into different species, but we don't have automatic detectors for all of these species yet, but we are currently working on them. Okay, so once you have detections on the hydrophones, the next process is to look at these detections across the different hydrophones and associate the same click or whistle arriving on the different hydrophones. So this process is basically just sliding the detections from one phone over the detections from another phone and looking at the peaks and the matches across the two phones to determine the time difference of arrival across the two phones. And I'm kind of going a little bit quick here, but. This is just sort of a sort of general overview here. So what we do is, if you look at the um, picture of Odtech here, and you can see there are these uh, hexagons that are overlaid on, on it, what we do is try to make smaller arrays within the larger hydrophone array. And then you can use time differences of arrival across multiple groups of phones within these smaller arrays to localize sound in X, Y, and Z. So you solve the equation and you're trying to just estimate where the animal is in space with respect to the hydrophones. So one of the ways that we use the MPR system is for real-time monitoring. So for many of our collaborative projects, um, we're partnered with people in the water that we're directing to groups of animals. So the MCR team is sitting inside in a windowless room in a very boring place and we're telling somebody who's out on the water actually interacting with the animals where to go. And so what we see is something like this on our displays. So at the top over here, you're seeing the uh, map of the range hydrophones, and then we're looking at individual outputs from um, the different uh, individual hydrophones. And so what I'm showing you here at one time is um, 
this middle arrow here is for a beaked whale that is uh, somewhere mid-range over here. Um, we have three phones looking at slow clicks from the sperm whale that is all the way up here to the north. And then there are groups down here of um, rough tooth dolphins that are in several places along the range. So a lot of it is real time with an analyst sitting and looking at the screens and determining what they're seeing and then telling people where to go depending on what species they're interested in. And if you zoom in on the range, um, you can see these are the localizations from clicks. Um, for rough tooth dolphins here, so there's these groups of apparent rough tooth dolphins that are showing up on the range, and also these bluer um, icons are of a beaked whale that's further up. So that's how we're able to try and um, send people to different locations to try to find these groups, both to visualize them and to let us know so that we can confirm that the sounds we're hearing are from that species, or to put a tag um, or do photo ID work or biopsies depending on the study. So we collaborate with a variety of organizations and some of these, as I mentioned before, to put tags on cetaceans on the range and that allows us to do more detailed studies of the behavior of animals with respect to Navy activities. So I wanna recognize our partners from Marine Ecology and Telemetry Research, the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of St. Andrews, <clears throat> Cascadia Research Collective, and Sea Inc. Um, for all the work that they do in collaboration with us to put tags on these animals. And there's two types of tags that we work on depending on the goals of the study. The first are satellite tags. And these telemeter data on animal position and basic diving behavior over satellites and can stay on for weeks um, to months in duration. And you can use the data from these tags to look at longer term broad behavioral patterns. The second type are D tags, which are short term tags. They generally only stay on for hours to days, but they provide highly detailed movement and behavioral data. And they also record all of the sounds produced or heard by the tagged whale. So these tags, are really good for looking at highly detailed, immediately, immediate behavioral responses to some of them. But you do have to recover the tags to offload the data, so that can make them somewhat difficult to use. So this plot, these plots are showing uh, data from a D-tag that was on a Blainville's beaked whale. And these data have been crucial for helping us to determine the range and beam pattern of echolocation clicks. And this was an analysis that was done by Jess Schaefer and you like looking at the, the same clicks that were recorded on the D tag and on the AUTAG array hydrophones. And so by knowing the orientation of the animal that was clicking, you can get an idea of the probability of detection of a given echolocation click on the hydrophone array. And this information is really important for analyses such as estimating abundance from passive acoustics. Because in order to estimate how many animals might be vocalizing on the range, you need to know how many clicks you're detecting but also how likely it is that a given click produced by an animal will be detected on a given hydrophone. So given these analysis tools, I'm gonna to go over um, just some of the basic anal data analyses we've been working on. So depending on the spacing of the hydrophones and the click characteristics of the animals, we can process the click data to track individual vocalizing whales. So this is a project that was developed by Judge Schaefer and Paul Bagenstoss and continued by Karen Dolan and Sarah Blackstock. And this is an image of the period of foraging of three Blainville's beaked whales. So the blue um, over here, you can see, is the start time and the red is the end time through this period of vocalization. And the colors are time aligned across the three whales. So for this group dive, you can see that the three whales start together and then they start echolocating around 700 meters depth, which is when we can start picking them up on the hydrophones. And then they separate in space at similar depths once they reach presumably the foraging layer, and then start to come back together when they stop echolocating before going back to the surface. So this is the first study to look at individual movements of all of the animals within a group simultaneously. And these are just some examples I'm going to show you of some group dives in the X and Y. So these aren't showing you depth, they're just showing you the horizontal spacing. Um, and this is for groups that had two individual whales in the group. So just pairs of whales. 
So you can see that for some groups, like on the top right um, over here, you see the animals separate quite a bit during foraging. So they started together, and then at some point they were quite far apart before starting to come back together. Whereas others, like this one here in the top, um, were generally fairly close together, although they were a little bit separated horizontally, but, but much more closer together than some of the other groups we've seen. And then this is just an example for groups with three whales. So again, the dark blue is where the start occurs. They're often somewhat close together and then separate out during the foraging um, event and then sometimes start to come together. Sometimes they must come together after they finish, uh, after they stop echolocating because they're still quite separated at the end. But they generally do come back together by the time they reach the surface. So this is um, just some of the work that we're doing to try to understand basic baseline behavior of these individuals in sort of a non-disturbed um, condition. So one of the benefits of the MPR system is that in theory, it can be collecting data all the time and therefore can lead to the curation of long-term data sets. So this is a plot of data availability from the Southern California range off of San Clemente Island from the years 2010 to 2014. So it starts in 2010, 2011, 12, 13, and 14. And anywhere that there are black dots indicates that there's data available. <clears throat> so there's periods of time where the range shuts us down for one reason or another, or power outages that shut the system, or equipment failures, or security software requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera which lead to holes in the data set. So we do have gaps of time where we don't have any data. But over enough time, if we can maintain the system, then we can get data that are sufficient to start looking for long-term trends. So one important question is, how does the abundance and density of species of interest change over time on these ranges? And there are two methods that we currently use to estimate abundance and density for beaked whales in particular. And the first is to use the total amount of clicks that are detected. It's called click counting. So if you have some information on how often animals produce clicks, you can estimate how many animals are on the range and how often you're likely to detect them. The second uses the total number of times that you see an overall group clicking. And then given an estimate of how often groups dive on the range, you can estimate the number of animals localizing. So both of these methods require ground truthing with either tags recording vocal behavior of individual animals or focal follows for understanding group diving behavior. So I'm gonna play this animation. I don't, I'm hopeful that it'll play for you. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the pattern of beaked whale vocalizations look like over time, this animation is showing the hourly number of Cuvier's beaked whale echolocation clicks that are detected on the range um, for about three days in 2014 on the Southern California anti-submarine range. So each of these bullseye events that you're seeing generally represents one group vocal period, which is the duration of continuous clicking during foraging of a single Cuvier's um, group. And generally these group vocal periods average 20 to 40 minutes in duration. So this just gives you sort of an idea of how often and over what sort of spatial scale we're seeing echolocation clicks from these groups. So when you have a long-term data set, you can start to look at overall trends in population abundance. The two top rows are showing the same set of data as the plots two sides ago that I showed you on data availability. But now you're seeing the average number of Cuvier's beaked whales on the Southern California range at any time in a given month. So the red dots, if you can see them at all, um, are the measure of effort, how many days of active data were available that month. So you can see whether a particular abundance estimate is based on a lot of data for the month or only you know, one or two days. And the bottom plot here is a composite of all of the years together. So what you can see overall is that there is a trend of highest, oh geez, sorry, highest abundance in uh, late spring, early summer, and lowest abundance in late summer and early fall. And if you look at all of the years together over time, you can see that there are some months that we have data for in every year over this time period. 
So this plot is showing the average Cuvier's beaked whale abundance in December for all of these different years, 2010 through 2014. And again, the red dots are the total days of available data in the month for each year. So the overall takeaway from this plot is that we are seeing a fairly stable abundance in December across five years of data, given the confidence intervals that we have to work with. So it's really important for us to be able to collect these data and build up these long-term data sets. There was a paper published um, a few years ago that suggested the population of beaked whales in Southern California overall was declining um, based on, I think, sighting cruisers and stranding um, records. But we don't really see a similar trend within our range. And it may, may be that maybe the area of the range is a highly um, desired location in terms of prey quality and maybe animals wouldn't, we wouldn't see a decline there first. Um, but just given what we're seeing from our five years of data here, we're not seeing a similar trend. So obviously one of the things that we're most interested in is understanding the impact of Navy activities on marine species particularly in these areas where the Navy is doing a lot of training and testing, and where we know that there are some resident populations of animals, or populations that spend a large chunk of their time on the ranges. So I'll start by describing a study led by Elena McCarthy and was published in, which was published in 2011. And this plot shows the modeled estimated accumulated sound energy over a three-day multi-ship training activity at AUTEC uh, in the Bahamas. So this is Andros Island here, this is the tongue of the ocean, and this is the um, Autec range. And that Northwest Providence Channel was up here where that stranding event occurred, what I, I talked about in the beginning. So what this is showing is not what any animal would experience at any given time during the event, but the total energy that was put out into the environment um, during that event. And so you can see that the highest levels of sound energy in red here um, were located on the range, but there was still some um, fairly high levels that were um, broadcast out beyond the range. So Elena was focusing on Blainville's beach whales on the Autec range, and each graph on this bar shows the average number of vocalizing foraging groups on the range in a five-hour time window. So it's showing you a window into how often foraging was occurring by beach whales on the range. And time is broken up into approximately two and a half days before the event, during the event, the first two and a half days after the event, and the next two days after that. Now what is very obvious from this plot is that the average number of foraging groups decreased during the course of the sonar event, then started to increase after the event ended, but didn't return to pre-event levels until more than two and a half days after the event ended. She also found that the groups that were vocalizing during the event were doing so for shorter periods of time than is typical without sonar. So not only was there less foraging events occurring, the foraging events were shorter in duration. So this, these plots are showing you um, two different training events, and the one we were just looking at the bar plot for is the one at the bottom. So the colors here represent the average rate of group vocal periods in each time period. And in general, you can see some level of group foraging before the events, a sharp decrease during the events, and then an increase again after the event is over. And the question that comes from this is, are the animals on range just going quiet, not foraging during the sonar event, or are the animals actually leaving the range during the event and coming back after the event is over? because there are energetic costs to each of those choices, right? So if you just stay but stop foraging, <clears throat> then you're missing feeding for several days, which could obviously impact individual health. If you leave and go some forage somewhere else during the event, you might be better off, but you have the energetic cost of traveling some distance. And also, if you travel to an area uh, where the prey quality is lower, you could still be compromised in a similar way as if you just stayed put and waited it out. So Elena looked at the pattern of group vocal periods in six hour windows um, after the sonar events ended. So in each, in these plots, the, the black circles represent new hydrophones that were detected, um, that detected beaked whales in each time block 
in, in, I mean, in each in, in that time block. So the black ones are new ones in that time block, and the gray circles represent hydrophones where beak whales had previously been detected in, in the previous time blocks. So I'm sorry, that was kind of a confusing way to say that. But what you should look for in this is in this first time block on the top left, you see the gray, the, the black circles are on the um, western, southern, and northern portions of the range. And then as you move later in time, so here we have the, in the top right, we have 0 to 12 hours. You see black dots are kind of appearing more towards the center of the range. Again, 0 to 18 hours and 0 to 24 hours. So what it appears is that as you move further in time, the detections are also moving in towards the center of the range. And this suggests that animals are leaving the range entirely and then returning slowly over time. So if the animals had just stayed put during the event, once it was over and vocalizations re started reoccurring, you would see them sort of occurring generally everywhere across the range at the same time, not mostly focused on the edges and then moving to the center. And we see something similar from tagged beaked whales during these large sonar events as well. So the top plot shows the locations of a tagged Blainville's beaked whale before, during, and after a large multi-day sonar event. And the range is highlighted in that gray. So as the animal moves, um, the animal moves farthest away from the range during the sonar event, which you can see also in the distance from sonar activity on the bottom graph as well and then eventually comes back to the range after the event was over, so several days later. So we performed a similar study analyzing Cuvier's beaked whale presence during shorter training events on the Southern California range. So what I was just showing you was a multi-ship, multi-day event. Um, here we're looking at events that are much shorter in duration, so less than generally six hours in duration. And we looked at events using two different types of sonar, high-powered sonar, such as whole-mounted ship sonar, and mid-power sonar, such as helicopter-deployed dipping sonar. And these events are on the, as I said, the events are on the order of hours. So I think what I'm showing you here for this first one with high-power events is an average of nine different events. And the top figures show you that, sort of similar to that last plot, the mean um, rate of group vocal periods across the range. So you see a similar pattern of what we saw at Atec, where before you had vocalization spread out across the range, during you see a, a pretty marked decrease, and then after you see vocalization spreading back out across the range again. And the graph uh, shows the mean number of vocal periods before, during, and after for each of these events as well. So you see this trend of a general decrease and then an increase after for Cuvier's beak whales. Now, if we look at the same data for 11 mid-power sonar events, um, we see something similar to what we just saw for the high-power events. So you see generally animals spread across the range, somewhat of a decrease, particularly in the north part portion of the range, which is where a lot of the sonar activity occurs, and then after you see spreading back out again. But when we ran a GLM looking at both types of events, we saw a definite decrease during the mid-power events, but this decrease was not as strong as during the high-power sonar events. So these mid-power sonar events um, are shorter in duration, so generally less than four hours in duration, and they seem to overall cause less of a change in distribution across the whole range compared with before and after. And that may just be because animals don't have time to completely exit the range because it's not a three-day event, it's a shorter event. So we're not sure in these shorter events whether animals are actually leaving or if they are um, just staying quiet for a shorter period of time. So these plots are also from a study at the Southern California range, looking at the behavior of satellite tagged PVA speed trails to mid-power and high-power sonar events. And this is from a paper published by Aaron Falcone in 2017. And Aaron showed that the closer individual whales were to a sonar event, the more changes there were to their diving behavior. So these plots are showing inter-deep dive interval, or the time from the start of one hour-long foraging dive to the start of the next one. And a short inner dive, inner deep dive interval indicates that the animals are diving and foraging often, so they're not spending a lot of time resting at the surface in between foraging dives. Whereas a long inner dive interval, inter-deep dive interval, suggests a decrease in foraging behavior. 
So in these plots for both high and mid power sonar, that inter deep dive interval gets longer the closer the animal was to sonar. So in other words, foraging decreased as distance to sonar increased. And you have to focus on the parts of the graph that are less than 150 or 200 kilometers from sonar because the sample sizes are small at the bigger distances and the confidence intervals kind of blow up. But you can see in the absence of sonar, which are the two plots to the right of each of the bigger plots, um, the inner dive interval is pretty tight and consistent um, and very different than the length of it during the sonar events, which is much longer. So what do we do with this information? Um, well, the Navy is required by law to request a permit from the National Marine Fisheries Service for any training or testing activities that could impact marine mammals, sea turtles, and any endangered species. And the Navy is required in the permit application to analyze the activities and estimate the impact of those activities on the marine species. And the way that we do this in the Navy is using the Navy Acoustic Effects Model, or NEMO, we call it. And to look at each type of event, we combine data on the type of platforms, like ships or submarines, the types of sonar, the density of animals we expect in the area, and the environmental conditions when the event might occur. And then we simulate the event and look at the sound levels that individual animals might experience. So in collaboration with National Marine Fisheries Service, we have developed criteria that we measure uh, individual exposure levels against. So for example, for sonar, and that's what um, one of these you're seeing here in this little rainbow diagram, the criteria are PTS or permanent threshold shift, which is a permanent decrease in hearing sensitivity for some frequency ranges. TTS or temporary threshold shift, which is a temporary decrease in hearing sensitivity, and behavioral disturbance. And what we need to know in order to apply these models is at what received sound levels will animals experience any of these criteria states. So developing the thresholds associated with these criteria are really important. So this is one of the areas that we are actively working in. This, um, what I'm showing here is the methodology that was developed by Dave Moretti and Tiago Marquez and Len Thomas at the University of St. Andrews. And these plots show the probability of a vocal period starting on a given hydrophone as a function of the received level of sound at that hydrophone. And these two plots are basically showing the same thing. So the idea is that animals must decide to start a foraging dive when they're somewhere at the surface. So Dave looked at the sound levels the animals were receiving at the time that they would be making that decision to dive. And this data set was based on one of those multi-day sonar events in AWTEC that I um, showed you from Elena's study. So if you look at this plot here on the right, um, this is plot on a linear scale, you see a decrease in the probability the animals will dive as a function of the sound level. So as sound level increases, probability of diving decreases. And so you can flip the probability of a dive starting to the probability that a dive won't start, which can be used as a measure of behavioral disturbance, given the known probability of a dive group starting in time periods without sonar. So this creates what we call a behavioral response function. And this is developed for different species based on what is known about their hearing and behavior from field studies. And these behavioral response functions feed into the NEMO model that are used for estimating impacts on species, in particular, the one that we've developed for ODTEC for beach whales. So another area of work that this is feeding into is trying to estimate the long-term consequences of exposure on populations. And this work involves using the PCOD model, which stands for Population Consequences of Disturbance. So a version of the PCOD model is shown here in this top figure. And in this version, sonar exposure causes some behavioral change, such as a decrease in foraging effort, which causes some impact on animals' overall health in terms of energy stores. And this change in health affects some change in individuals um, that could lead to changes in vital rates, such as available stores to feed a calf or the ability to become pregnant, et cetera. 
and then this change in vital rates would then lead to a measurable change in population dynamics, such as the ratio between dependent calves and adult females. So if you have more calves, that ratio will be higher. If you have fewer calves, that ratio will be lower. So the bottom graph here is work by uh, results of a photo ID study by Diane Claridge at Autech and in Abaco. So Autech, this is Andros Island, this is Autech here in the red square, and up here is the Abaco study site. And what you're seeing is the ratio of dependent calves to adult females in Abaco, which is an unexposed population, and Autech, where there's sonar activity that goes on the range. And you can see that there is a decrease in this ratio at Autech. So it suggests there's fewer calves per the, given the number of adult females you would expect compared to Abaco. Now there could be lots of other factors that differ between these two populations other than just sonar activity level. Um, there could be prey quality or prey availability or predator abundance, um, any number of things. But this is the first attempt at applying the PCOD model to test for these differences. And I just want to point out that there's a lot of assumptions that need to be made for this and other versions of the PCOD model, and almost all of them are unknown. So each of these represents an area of research that needs to happen to better parameterize these models. And as I said at the start, the overall goal is to understand the health of populations living on these ranges. Most of our work to date looks at short-term responses to an event. But what does an animal do that is exposed to multiple events over long periods of time? So this plot is showing the relative levels of localizing beaked whales and mid-frequency sonar on one of the ranges. So if an animal is spending a lot of time on the range, what effect does this cumulative exposure have? So this plot is of satellite tracks for eight tagged PBS beaked whales in Southern California from a paper by Shore et al. in 2014. And the white outline in the main part of the figure is the instrumented range. And you can see that a lot of the daily position estimates, which are all these um, colored squares, occurred on the range. And then the inset is the entire, uh, in black we'll outline there, is the entire Southern California range complex, where there's broader sonar training events that occur as well. And the colored lines represent the overall tracks of the whales. And the takeaway from this is that these whales were choosing to spend much of their time within the sonar range complex and within the SOAR instrumented range itself. And this table here is from Falcone et al. 2017, which is showing the numbers of different behavioral events available from the satellite tag data for analysis. And the last four columns list the number of deep presumed foraging dives, shallow non-foraging dives, surface intervals between any two dives, and inner deep dive intervals. And in the parentheses next to each of those in numbers is the percentage of those behaviors that overlapped with sonar. So the overlap could be anywhere from five seconds of overlap to overlapping the entire behavior. So these long-term tag, um, long tags start to give us a picture of cumulative exposure for a single animal as well as variability between animals. And so just to point out uh, a couple things, if you look at tag ID 16, which is this third one here, this animal had 18 of its deep dives, or 18% of its deep dives, 14% of its shallow dives, 11% of its surface intervals, and 27% of its inner deep dive intervals overlapping with sonar. And tag ID 28, which is down here, uh, who spent all of the time wearing a, the tag on the range, um, it overlapped with sonar for 9% of its deep dives and 23% of its inner deep dive intervals. Tag 15, which is the second one, had the highest overlap in its deep dive intervals with 31% of them overlapping to some degree with sonar activity. So we know that these animals are exposed multiple times and yet are choosing to stay in the region. So it's important for us to understand what the impacts are to these individuals, um, what this could mean for the population altogether, and then if there are things that we could change to minimize exposure, but that would still allow sailors to train and be prepared for current and future events. Um, these are all important questions for us to try to answer. So with that, I just wanna um, thank the current M3R team and I put my contact information there if anybody has any further follow-up questions, but I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have.
Jen, I'm not hearing you at all. I don't know if you're still. Uh -oh. Can you not hear me now? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I was like, woo. All right. Um, so we have some questions. I think I think the best way is, is if, if people don't mind, I'll mind the chat room. And if people um, can ask a question, why don't we do it that way so everybody can hear? Um, that sounds good. So. Unless anybody in this room, does anybody in this room have any questions? We have, to, sorry about the delay. So we have to, we, <laughs> we have to wait um, to see if anybody has any, but any tag or any tagged questions, any chat questions. You can tell that I was listening. Um, and two people, also, if people want to just chat in too, if there are multiple people in your rooms, that helps us keep track of how many people we're reaching. I guess I can unmute everybody too. Let's try. Uh, I'm going to unmute all just in case people have questions from other rooms where there's multiple people. Send it. <laughs> So, all right. Oh, here's a question. Are the prey of the whales affected by the sonar? Um, that's a really good question. That's uh, one that we haven't looked into very closely, but um, we're just starting to work with some people like Kelly Van Whitebird. Uh, we worked with um, Duke as well to try to map prey availability and prey density within some of these range areas so that we can start to see if there's any changes um, during sonar events in both prey availability and animal distribution. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, there's another one. Hi, Stephanie. You spoke about satellite tags and D-tags. You mentioned that the automation detection isn't yet fully developed for all species. Do you think we will need to incorporate a tagging activity at CFMETER in Nanus? I don't, I don't know what those are. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, so the Nanus range is in Canada. They're, they're in your um, ah, okay. Vancouver Island. They're, it's a Canadian Navy range that they're interested in putting in a similar system to. Um, it's probable that we'll need to do some initial groundwork there, yes, to, to understand the relationship between what we're seeing on the phones and the species that are present. Awesome. Uh, next question. When you pick up calls at 700 meters depth, is that because the whales typically only start calling at these depths? Uh, yeah, so from tag data, we know that they often don't start echolocating until um, much deeper down in the water column. The, Hydrophones are located on the seafloor, but we do generally pick up um, vocalizations near the seas as well. We have two questions from you, Maine. How far would the whales need to go to get out of the rain and the military exercises? Um, sorry, Jen, you could have got overshadowed there. You say how far would they need to move out of the range? Yep. Uh, it's unclear. I mean, we received some impact from the tide the satellite tag study at larger distances. So like I said, up to 100 kilometers away, we were seeing some deep, some increase in that inner dive, deep dive interval from the Cuvier's peak whales. So they may have to move fairly far in order to not see any impact. <laughs> okay, and then here's a kind of a related one. Do the hydrophones pick up the sounds of the military exercises? I would say yes to that too, probably. Yes, they do. All right, and then, um, do another question here. Do you have any recommendations on the required density of hydrophones to perform this work? Can you reduce the number if a new installation is established? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that is a good question. I'm not sure. I'd have to like pawn that off to somebody else in our group. My, mm -hmm. my guess is that, I mean, these phones are, you know, several kilometers apart. Mm -hmm. So in order to get clicks from an individual on multiple phones for localization, they can't be too far apart because you're just not going to get, you're just going to get them on a single phone, which would be less useful. So I'm not sure how much more you could reduce it. It'd be always be nice to increase the density. <laughs> okay, we've got two more questions and then we'll probably call it because this is, this is great question. So um, is there any data about whether the Navy ranges are preferable foraging areas when the sonar events are not going on? For instance, would there be less commercial ships to bother the whales? 
Um, that's a good question. So some Navy areas are considered de facto refuges because there are less um, commercial ship traffic and other types of um, activity. Uh, I, I'm blanking right now. There was a study done looking at, I think at Autech, at some of the, um, just an acoustic study looking at prey um, density, I think on the range and slightly off the range. And I honestly don't remember what the difference was. I think it was possibly higher on the range, but I honestly can't remember right now. So it's possible that it is a preferred habitat and that's why animals are choosing to stay there. We haven't quite sorted that out yet because we also don't always know if they are leaving where they're actually going in order to prepare to. And our last question with our time is, do the population estimation formulas assume straight line propagation in homogeneous media? There seems a very simple model for high frequencies that are more subject to diffraction and attenuation phenomena. Um, so I'm not sure because that's not my area of expertise, but my thought is that we're not um, necessarily caring about how good of a job the phones are for estimating as long as we can, uh, for detecting, as long as we can know what the false negative rate is or the false positive rate. So if we, if we know how much we're missing, then it doesn't matter if we're doing a poor job at detecting because we can correct for that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's a propag yeah, propagation. This, uh, there are some, I don't know about these density estimation ones, but I know that there are other density estimation algorithms that definitely take into account that propagation and, and blackout areas and stuff like that. So you have to look at the details of each individual algorithm because some of them are very related to propagation and others are not as heavily um, related to propagation. Yeah, and ours aren't. They're just more related to propagation in terms of what, how likely you are to detect the click, but not necessarily in any other ways. So I've been working on a, uh, with the University of St. Andrews on a bearing only SNR type estimation algorithm for density from passive acoustics. And there, the propagation is, is very key and we have to use um, parabolic equation modeling and look, right. look at it 360 degrees because that impacts where your distribution is. But that's a, it's a whole different seminar. <laughs> And we're only we're only looking at within the range, so we often throw out the outer range of hydrophones when we do those estimates. So we're only looking at groups that we know are physically located on the range. We're not trying to detect further out. All right, I, I think that brings us to our time. Andrea, did you want to say anything in closing? Uh, we'll see you again in a month for our, our next online seminar. And I will send out a email reminder to everybody a week before me. All right, thank you. It's the second Tuesday of every month, I think. So just have to mark it on your calendars. All right, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Stephanie. This was thank awesome. You, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.